Well, this morning, ladies, this is the day you've all been waiting for because today is the day we begin to talk to the men, in particular to husbands, but this is a message to all men. Uh, Either you are a husband, have been a husband, will be a husband, and so this is a word for you from God. So if you'll turn your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 5, I want to read that whole passage from chapter... Uh, 5 verse 22 through the end of the uh, chapter, but we'll, we'll spend some time in this. So in verse 22 he says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. And we, for the last few weeks we've been looking at that. Now we're going to be addressing verse 25 and onward. He says, husbands, love your wives. And that's a present active imperative. That means at all times, in every place, in every situation, love your wife. Just as Christ also loved the church, He tells us how to do it. And gave Himself up for her. He says, so that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her, by the washing of water with the Word, so that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. He says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. And then he adds this little proviso. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife. Again, a present active imperative or command, uh, even as himself, and the wife must see that she respects her husband. Now in this passage, we've been discussing at great length the divinely established principles for all successful relationships, that being the principle of authority and submission. That's that's the foundation of any relationship, whatever that relationship may be. You cannot even have a relationship with your dog or your cat that's not based on that principle if it's going to be a good one. You let your dog take over the house? and he becomes the authority over you, you're in trouble. Right? Same thing with cats. But we saw from 1 Corinthians 11.3 that God divinely has ordered uh, relationships. It tells us that the Father is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the man. The man is the head of the woman. And then we saw that spirit-filled people in the body of Christ in the church are subject to one another in the fear of Christ in Ephesians 5.21. It has nothing to do with inferiority or becoming a second-class citizen, but everything to do with equality and the various roles and responsibilities that make relationships work. And the point is is that we are to all willingly be serving someone else besides ourselves. That's at the very basis of all that. Authority and submission, even the one in authority is serving the one who's in submission. The one in submission is serving the one who's in authority. It's a give-and-take type of service and, and uh, submission to one another, and that's why Ephesians 5.21 is in the Bible. In that regard, we saw the scope of the wife's submission in verse 22, as unto the Lord and to her own husband. She willingly serves Christ. She willingly serves her own husband. That's how she rolls, as they say in the modern vernacular. And then we saw the spirit of the wife's submission that She is to do it joyfully and willingly as unto the Lord, her own husband being the benefactor of her love for Christ, as verse 24 says. Last week we looked at her roles and responsibilities in the home. Amazing. We saw Proverbs 31, just an amazing woman who, she's the oiko despotes of her house. She's the ruler of the house. She runs the house. She's the one that's her hub from which she operates. And it's amazing what uh, the Proverbs 31 woman does. And then we saw a role in the church. We saw the woman can serve as deaconess, uh, female servants. We saw 
uh, the widow's list. We saw that, and then we saw a society where the older women are to train up the younger women to be husband lovers, children lovers, workers at home that the word of God may not be dishonored. So it's a great and a noble role that God has given the woman both in the home, in the church, and in society. Now this morning from the passage we just read, I want, I want to talk about men loving their wives. Or at least begin that process. We're going to take some time in here, men, because there's a lot of verses addressed to us as men, right? I mean, there's like two for the women and there's like ten for the men. So guess where God wants to concentrate? Okay? Uh, so we're going to see that. Uh, we want to talk about men loving their wives because four times in this passage, in verse 25, twice in verse 28, once in verse 33, men are told to love their wives and twice commanded to love their wives. So it's not just a good idea, it's a matter of obedience, isn't it? Either we're obedient to God in that regard or we're disobedient, one or the other. Now notice also that not once in this passage is the wife told to love her husband. In fact, in the whole New Testament, you'll have a hard time finding that. It is uh, mentioned in Titus, as we saw. But uh, they're not told to love their husbands, but they're told to be subject to him and told to respect him. And that tells me something about the difference between men and women. Because I think the silence here is deafening. And as I thought about this, I I came to realize that women have very little problem with loving, whereas men seem to have a bigger problem in that area. Uh, You know, sometimes you come up and hug a guy and you think he's having an out-of-body experience, but that, you know, that's that's just a, a, a symptom. Most women can love most anything. I mean, look at us guys. I mean, if you looked in the mirror lately, uh, they take in every stray kid, every stray dog, every stray cat in the neighborhood, or they're willing to. You know, it's no big thing. I was, I was just counseling a couple, and, and uh, they, she comes home with a dog, even though dogs aren't allowed in those apartments, right? So it's, uh, you know, that, that's just the way a woman is. But they do have a hard time respecting the man and being submissive to the man because of Genesis 3.16. You know, your desire will be for your husband, it says, and he shall rule over you. Even though he rules over you, your desire is still to rule over him, though you love him. Because who can do it better than a woman? You know, and get the job done, right? Anyway, that's the deal. And, and, but women, by virtue of the creation and uh, the divine order of things, are more responders. They're more emotional and sensitive, involved relationally. Uh, women get along better, it seems. Uh, they're more subjective. They often respond more with their heart and their emotions. And they don't have a problem loving. They just have a problem following, for the most part. Or for a big part. Men, on the other hand, can be more cold and calculating. Men can be the lone wolf of the north or central California. And left to themselves without the Holy Spirit's intervention can be users and opportunists and very cold. And not only Scripture, but the whole of history of mankind will bear this out. You know, it's not Alexandria the Great, it's Alexander the Great. It's not King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, it's King Nebuchadnezzar who was brutal. Uh, Prima facie evidence is this, who was the last woman to start a war? Anybody come up with one? I don't know, Joan of Arc? I don't know, she didn't start the war, but she was involved. Involved in it. You know, Boko Haram took captive 300 girls, not boys, to use for their devious purposes. You know, who was the last guy you ever heard of being beat up, abused, or raped by his girlfriend? Seriously. When, when was the last one you heard of? You don't hear about that kind of thing. You know, you see, men left to their sinful nature are aggressive, they're dominant, 
Uh, they can be takers. They can be users of everything and everyone around them. Uh, we have that kind of potential. You know, let me share an incident with you that this week that I saw. It, it just amazed me. Uh, Wednesday, went to the conference, came home, had dinner, spent time with family and stuff, and went walking with my nephew. Uh, later on that night, uh, walking the dog, we took the dog. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, I get ready for bed, get, you know, and go over my sermon. I walk, get up and uh, I look out the window and there's all these police cars just cordoning off the entire street. And I look down at the intersection that's not too far away and there's like 15 police cars and there's that, you know, that crime tape and all that stuff they put around things. They're not letting anybody through and they're one guy pulled up and they, you know, they're checking his trunk to see if he's hoofing, you know, the, 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 whatever the perpetrator was out of there. And so anyway, I finally work up courage to go outside. I'm, you know, kind of afraid to get shot or something. And, uh, I walk up to the, it happened to be a police woman. And I said, what, what, what's going on here? And she said, well, there was domestic violence. And this is the last place the guy was seen. So we're hunting him down and there's searchlights going up the street. I mean, those like billion lumen things and uh, all that kind of stuff. And uh, so anyway, I finally went to bed because I couldn't stay up any later and still function the next day. So the next day, uh, we read about this guy who had beat up his girlfriend. And when uh, Mama and Grandma came to save them, her, uh, Mama got stabbed 18 times. Girlfriend didn't get stabbed, but Mama got stabbed 18 times because obviously she was trying to save her daughter. And Grandma got stabbed seven times. Neither of them died, but, you know, that's, uh, that's what we men are capable of. You know, just kind of file that away. Uh, in this passage, recognizing that commands husbands to be lovers of their wives and their children and others because they are lovers of the one true God. The uh, Husbands, love your wives. Why? Because you love Christ. Because you love God and He loves you. So be a lover of others. Hard for men to be lovers. That's why they're commanded to be lovers because it's much easier to be brutal and just take what you want. And that's the history of mankind, isn't it? You know, they say since the, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, there has been one year where there hasn't been war on this planet. And very little of that has been perpetrated by women. So women are commanded to respect, to be submissive to their husbands. Men are commanded to love their wives. And then he tells them, that they're to love their wife in a special way. You know, the new commandment to men and women alike in John 13, 34, and 35 given by our Lord is a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. How? Even as I have loved you. Okay, it's not just any kind of love. It's just not your little definition of love or societal definition. You know, love in America can mean anything from A to Z. We call it love. Making love, being in love, being in fashion, so on and so forth. But love as defined by God is us loving one another just as Christ has loved us. And then he says, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Not just any kind of love, but the same love I have for you. So he, he qualifies it there. Now, if that's true of the church, as the commandment was made in John 13, 34, and 35, how much more should that be true of the relationship between a husband and his wife? Husbands, love your wives. That's a command. Because you have the capacity to be brutal and dominant and a user and a taker. And it was in that society, as we went over a few sermons ago, just I wanted to give you the historical background on that and... Uh, you know, men were something else as far as their relationship with their wives. And here, Paul gives this counterculture, incredible message. Husbands, he commands them, love 
your wives. And then he tells them to love them in a special way. Now, lest you think that's impossible, at least in your marriage, (laughs) realize that God never commands without supplying the resources to fulfill that command. And in Romans 5.5, we're told that the love of God has been poured out within our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Amazing thing, it's been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So if you're a man and you know Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, so you have the potential to love your wife, and she has the potential to love you as Christ does. In fact, in, uh, when it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, what does it tell us? It tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love. And a lot of commentators will tell you that that is kind of like the whole overarching thing of, uh, of the whole passage, that love is defined by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. But the, the real fruit of the Spirit is love. That's what he tells us. It's powerful. Um, and once again, we see that the indwelling Holy Spirit has given us the unlimited resources and power of God to, to keep in our lives what He has commanded. God not only makes the command, but then He supplies the power for us to do it. We can do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think because of the indwelling Godhead. And uh, that's, that's a wonderful thing to know. And men, He has commanded us to love our wives. And if you're a Spirit-filled, Spirit-directed, empowered man, you have the capacity to put that command into everyday practice. Now, you might be sitting there thinking... What is love? You know, our, our society is so messed up that, that it's almost impossible to come up with a definition of love, isn't it? It's almost impossible to see if you look at culture. But what does the Word of God say? Well, I'm going to give you a very simple ABC definition of this morning. This is uh, nothing new that I haven't taught before. But I just want to remind you this morning of what I believe the Scripture says defines love as we begin this morning. So I want you to turn to John chapter 21. And actually, this just gives me an excuse to turn there once again. I love this passage. (laughs) And passages you love, you're just kind of drawn to, right? Because God speaks to you through these passages. And Peter's just denied the Lord three times, and I don't know how many times you denied Him this week or at least wouldn't mention him in in, uh, select circles. Uh, But, uh, you know, I I think of my own life, and and there's so many times that I just kind of pretend I'm just a regular guy who doesn't know the Lord. uh, But anyway, in verse 15, it says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And it's a neuter pronoun. Do you love me more than these things? They'd just been fishing and all that whole scene, and uh, do you love me more than your old way of life? And he uses the word agapao, and, and uh, we, we know, everybody knows agape love. If you've been a Christian for more than three days, you know that. Uh, and that's the highest form of love, we say. It's God's love. It's all kinds of different things that uh, everybody says this is the greatest form of love. So, uh, and he said to him, uh, yes, Lord, you know, and he uses the word oida, that means to know because you're God, you're omniscient. He says that I love you. Because Peter's having a hard time, uh, you know, just saying, oh yeah, I love you unequivocally. You know, I just denied you three times a couple days ago. But uh, yeah, I really love you a lot. And he says, so he uses the word phileo, and he says, I, you know, you know that I like you a lot. Jesus accepts that because he knows Peter's human. He knows he's fallible. He knows he's a sinful wretch like all of us. And he accepts that. He says, that's good enough for right now. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He uses the word agapao again. And he said, uh, yes, Lord, you know, uh, again, using uh, because you're omniscient that I love you, I like you a lot. And he said, shepherd my sheep. And then the third time he said to him, uh, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Jesus switches words, and I think that's why Peter was so grieved. Because Peter was grieved at that point, and he said, you know 
he says, uh, Lord, you know all things. And he again uses the word oida. You know because you're omniscient. You can see into my heart. You know what I really feel inside, although I can't demonstrate it at the moment. And then he says, you know, and he uses a different word, gnosko. You know from personal experience. You know from looking over the last three years that I love you. And Jesus accepts that, or I like you a lot. And uh, says, tend my sheep. You know, I love this passage because it's like God speaking to me. He's speaking to me often, Bob, do you love me more than these things? Do you even like me a lot? (laughs) Do you like me more than uh, what you're doing or who you are or what, you know, do you... uh, Do you like me being in your life? Do you like me being a part of your life? Do you like me being your life, period? Do you like serving me? Do you like serving my people? Do you like, you know, all those questions kind of run through your mind when you're reading this passage as they apply to us. Now, now simply put, Peter is being asked to make a value judgment. Does he love Christ more than his old way of life? Does he love Christ enough to take up the commission to to tend and feed and to shepherd his church? Does he love Christ enough to uh, shepherd the flock? Or would Peter continue valuing his own life above the life Christ was calling him to? In fact, uh, in in a moment, he would just say, you know, you're going to die for me, so let's go. Peter turns around and goes, well, what about John? He goes, don't worry about John, you follow me. And that was the calling and... uh, the Lord almost, almost it kind of reminds me of Moses and Aaron, right? God just says that Moses, I'm going to use you. You're going to go before Pharaoh. This is what I'm going to do through you. And Moses goes, oh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> and finally, the Lord is getting angry. And he says, you know, you've got a brother who speaks well. I'll use him. You'll be like God to him, and he'll speak to Pharaoh. And uh, anyway, anyway, that's another sermon. But uh, would this continue to be about Peter or would he value his life in Christ more? How much does he really love Christ? How much does he really value their relationship? Let me show it to you again. John 3.16, most famous verse in the entire world. It says, for God so loved the world. Okay, he uses the word agapao again, and uh, we say that's God's love, and and rightfully so. And He so loved the world, how much? That He gave His only begotten Son. That whoever should believe in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. How much did God value us? Well, to the point of giving His own life that we might have eternal life. It's an incredible thought. But then you just look three verses later in, in verse 19. It says, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness. He uses the word agapao again. They love the darkness. How much? Well, that they wouldn't come to the light because their deeds were evil. They loved their evil. They loved their evil. They valued their evil so much they were willing to go to hell and judgment for it. You know, and you hear that trite little thing when people, uh, you know, um, say, well, you know, I just want to be in hell to party with my buddies. They don't understand what they're saying. But they are telling you that they value their evil more than they value a relationship with Christ, more than they value forgiveness, more than they value eternal life in the presence of God if that's what they have to do. They'd rather be with their evil little buddies to hang out with them, and they have no idea what hell's going to be like where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But um, that's their attitude. They value that way more than they value any kind of relationship or any kind of uh, call of God upon their life. That's a tragedy. How great did God value the people of this world to the point of giving... His Son on the cross that we might live, that we might have eternal life and spend all eternity with Him. Uh, He made the ultimate sacrifice 
That's how much He loved us. How great do men value the darkness? How much do they value their evil to the point of hating the light with the consequence of spending all eternity apart from the light in the outer darkness of hell where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, eternal damnation. They would rather have hell. So much do they value their evil. You see, love is measurable. It's how much we value people or evil or the church or money or our husbands or our wives. How much we're willing to sacrifice to pay the price of having a good relationship with whatever you set your love on. It's an interesting thought. And I hope each of us will realize this as we continue our study in Ephesians chapter 5. So, if you'll turn back there, I want us to begin looking at the spirit-filled man as the lover of his wife. And in this passage, or the one who values his wife, And in this passage, we are going to see just how much the real Christian man values his wife or loves his wife. You can interchange the two words. And in that regard, we're going to look at three different aspects of that love or that value he places on his wife because we're going to see, number one, that he is the selfless lover of his wife. We'll look at that this morning in verses 23 and 25. Then secondly, the sanctifying lover of his wife. We'll see that in verses 26 and 27. And then thirdly, we're going to see that he is the satisfying lover of his wife in verses 28 through 30. So to begin with, let's look at the fact that he is the selfless lover of his wife. This is a verse we kind of skirted around before, but in verse 23 he says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Um, Now essentially Paul says the same thing in both these verses, doesn't he? Husbands, verse 23, are told to be head of their wives. Husbands, verse 25, are commanded to love their wives as if they are one and the same thing. Okay? Okay? Christ, verse 23, is said to be head of the church. Christ, verse 25, is said to love his bride, the church. Again, they are one and the same. To be the head is to love the church. To be the head of your home is to love your wife. That's the comparison he's making. Uh, Christ, verse 23, is said to be savior of his body, the church. Christ, verse 25, gave himself as a sacrifice for the life of his church, being the savior. And... Both verses tell us husbands are to love, to value their own wives as our Lord Jesus Christ loves and values His bride, the church. Totally sacrificially, totally selfless is the point he's making. Christ loves the church. Christ values us so much that He became our Savior. It says joyfully, Enduring the cross, Hebrews 12.2. Giving Himself up for us, verse 25 says. He gave Himself for us. Husbands are to love their wives in the same way. That's the kind of leadership a Spirit-filled man demonstrates towards his wife and children. He joyfully and willingly rules and serves those he leads. And like Christ, is highly exalted and served in return. But he rules selflessly and sacrificially. You say, how can that be? How can you be exalted if you become a servant? Well, flip over a couple pages to Philippians chapter 2. Again, this is one of those passages we all love. Uh, This is, I think, Don Collins' favorite passage. And he begins by saying, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, that's a first-class conditional clause. It means since there is encouragement in Christ, since there is consolation of love, since there is fellowship of the Spirit, since there is affection and compassion, he says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in the Spirit, intent on one purpose. That would be a wonderful marriage, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, that would be a great marriage. I see, I see Chris shaking his head. And that's true. That would be a great marriage if we... Uh, that would be a great relationship with anybody. 
You know, if we had complete joy, uh, if we had the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on what, how in the world is it done? How can you have a marriage like that? Because most people don't. He says, do nothing. How much? What was that word? How much? Nothing. Nunca. Nada. Nothing from selfishness or empty conceit or pride. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Oh my goodness, he's talking to all Christians here, isn't he? Even those who are famous. (laughs) Even those who get to speak at the conferences, Rick. So, uh, you know, everybody, clothe yourselves with humility, we're told. Clothe ourselves with Christ. And then he says, uh, do, do not merely look out for your own personal interests. In other words, you've got to take care of business, but also for the interests of others. Your focus isn't inward, like the cults and the, the you know, meditate to find the God within. You know, that kind of stuff, that's not it, but... It's your focus is outward towards others. You take care of your own business and you help others. Your focus is out there and how you can help them. And then he says, have this attitude or this mind, this humility of mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Oh, and now we're back to Christ, right? It's like, okay, I want you to be unified. I want you to maintain the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Here's how you do it. Uh, be selfless, don't be conceited, with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves, look out for the interests of others. And who's our example? Christ. Again, how do we love our lives, our wives? Like Christ loves the church. And so he says, have this mind in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who although exists in the form of God, there's no doubt who Christ is. He is the Ruler, He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the, the beginning and the end. The, and you could go on naming names for about 300 more names. He is all those things, but He existed in the form of God. And God is Spirit, but He took on flesh for you and me. And not only flesh, but He did not regard equality as God a thing to be grasped. He emptied Himself taking the form of a bondservant, not only becoming a man, but becoming our servant, our bond, our slave. The slave of our need. And being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, not only humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, but even death on a cross. Because he was the perfect Lamb of God who would come and give his life a ransom for many. What happened because of that? You think, oh, he went down in the annals of history as a loser. He went to heaven shamed because he got defeated at the cross. Well, don't forget the resurrection. And here's a kind of a description of that. He says, for this reason also, because Christ willingly became a selfless, sacrificial service in service to our need. It says, For this reason also God highly exalted Him, bestowed on Him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You say, wow, that's quite a road to glory, isn't it? But it ends in glory, doesn't it? Tell me, you know, what would happen to our world if we just put those 11 verses into practice? What would happen to your world, your marriage, your relationships if you just put those verses into practice? What if we did nothing from selfishness or empty conceit? What if we practiced humility of mind and action uh, on a constant basis? What if, we, what if we regarded others as more important than ourselves? What if we looked out for the interests and needs and cares of others, you know, especially our wives, our husbands, our our children, and came up with creative ways to love and serve them? What, What if we had the same attitude, the same humility of mind that Christ demonstrates towards us? 
How would our lives be different? <clears throat> what if we got up off the throne and became the servant, the doulos, the, the bond servant of others and their needs, particularly our families? What if we emptied ourselves of ourselves and filled our lives with Christ and the Holy Spirit? for the purpose of serving and ministering to others. Well, I'll tell you what, that man will be great. That man will be the Lord of his home. You see, Christ is the head of the church, the ruler, the king, the one with a name above every name because he loved us so much he gave himself for us. He is the king, he is the Lord, he is God, he is is the head, yet how has he demonstrated that? Well, by meeting our greatest need for redemption and forgiveness, by uh, the ultimate sacrifice of Himself, the One who, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's who He is. He's King. And because He values us so greatly, how do we relate to Him? Well, not as some low servant or some low-life person who couldn't get the job done. You know, we relate to Him as, as God. We relate to Him as the King, as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, as the exalted Savior, as the head of the church, because His love is absolutely unquestionable. So will be the man who loves his wife like Christ. She will adore Him and honor Him, and respect Him, and have no problem being submissive to Him. See what I'm saying here, men? If you want to be treated like a king, if you want to be lord of your home, head of your home, learn to value and serve your wife even as Christ does, selflessly and sacrificially. You know, even when Christ washed the disciples' feet, it was interesting, His take on the whole thing when He gets done. He says, you know, if I, the Lord and Master and the Teacher, wash your feet, how should you relate to one another? Didn't diminish him. Didn't make any, anything less than he was. It made him, in essence, it actually made him more than he was in their eyes. He was already whatever he you know, has been from eternity past, but in their eyes, he became more. Here, they're, they're arguing. Luke 22 tells about who's the greatest, and, you know, they, they couldn't figure it out because none of them were. And they were in the presence of the greatest, and the greatest takes off his robe, girds a towel, and washes their feet. And that kind of humility made him even greater in their eyes. But that's what will happen to the man who loves and serves his wife that way. You know, be a man she can respect, act like the king, the Lord Jesus, and she will treat you like she would the king. You know, that's a divine paradox, isn't it? Men are to serve those they mean to rule. You know, in Acts 20, what does it say? The greatest among you should be your servant. First among you should be your slave. And those men practiced that, and they were the greatest. Those apostles went out and blitzed the world with the gospel. You know, Jesus, or Peter said in 1 Peter 5, he says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and He, what? Will exalt you. That's the point. It's a paradox, though. We would rather dominate, we would rather rule, we would rather rule with an iron fist. That's the way the world is, and that's the disease we've caught from the world, the sin. But not so in the kingdom of God. You know, 1 John 4.19 simply says, we love because He first loved us. Christ took the initiative, therefore we respond to His love. You know, men are to do the same with their wives. You serve them, you love them, and you'll have no problem ruling your home. So men, let's quit standing around and waiting for someone to serve us. Let's take the initiative. And I'm not talking about, you know, getting her a bigger credit card or you cooking dinner and she doesn't do her wifely 
uh, stuff that women are designed to do to be rulers of their home. I'm talking about serving them and loving them like Christ does the church. He's unequivocally the head of the church. But he does that through serving and loving us and demonstrating that love towards us, doesn't he? Take the initiative, take the lead, take the headship, and be like Christ, the selfless lover of the church. Uh, Let's become the selfless lovers of our wives and our families. Be Christ-like, serve those you rule, and you will be served and loved. So today we've seen Christ as our model, who, and we'll see more of him as our model, but who sacrificially and selflessly took the initiative to demonstrate his love towards us and We are commanded to do the same for our wives, men. Never underestimate the power and authority of a selfless servant. You know, they say Gandhi was a servant of his people. Can you think of any other premiers of India? (laughs) Whoever went down in history, I can't think of one except Gandhi. Whether he really was that or not is debatable, but that was his reputation, that he served his people. Uh, great politicians serve their people, although they rule them, right? Same thing here. A man rules his home by serving those he means to rule. Never, never underestimate the power and authority of a selfless servant. It is perhaps the greatest divine paradox there is in all of Scripture. Servants lead, servants rule, and Christ is our ultimate example of that. Well, We'll pick it up here next time. And as we look at the husband as a sanctifying, satisfying lover of his wife, uh, continue to ponder the paradox of a servant ruler with Christ being our ultimate example because, men, that is how we are commanded to love our wives. To begin with, selflessly and sacrificially. Not with our eyes on ourselves, what we're demanding, what we can get, but with our eyes on our family and our wives and our children as to what we can give to them that will transform and bless their lives. Let's pray.